Okay, well, welcome back to Hebrew Story Hour. I'm uh, really happy to have everybody with us, and we're going to be in Genesis 23 today. Again, the way if you're new, the way this works is I just read two, three, four verses and then translate. And well, this this time it's only 20 verses to chapter 23. So we'll go through it all and then we'll have time for discussion and questions and so on. Okay. Genesis 23. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Vayihyu chaye sara mea shana v'esrim shana v'sheva shanim. Shene Chaye Sara. Verse 2. Vatamot Sara. Bekiryat Arba. Hi Chevron. Be Eretz Kanaan. Vayavo Avraham. This pod, the Sara. The live Kota. I'm going to pause there because that's kind of our narrative introduction. Um, this first phrase, so they, the, it's really the lives of Sarah, but the life of Sarah was 127 years. So it's 100 years, 20 years, and seven years, the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, which it means uh, like four, the city of four. That is Kevron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to lament for Sarah and to weep for her or to mourn her. Okay, verse three. Vayakom Avraham meal pene meto. Vayadaber el bene chet le mor. Ger v'toshav anochi imachem, tunuli achuzat kever imachem, ve'ekbara meti milifanai. Verse 5. V'ya'anu v'nechet et Avraham lemor lo. Shema enu Adoni, nesi Elohim ata, Betochenu, Bamivchar Kivarenu, Kavor et Metecha, Ish Memenu et Kivro lo yikle mimcha, mik, uh, Mikvor Metecha. Okay, pausing there, going back to translate in verse three. And Abraham arose from beside his dead one, or his dead, and he spoke. To the sons of Chet, saying, the uh, sons of Chet, could, you could translate it as the Hittites, a foreigner and a sojourner, am I with you? Give to me a burial possession or a place of for burial with you, so that I might bury my dead uh, away from me or from, from before me. Verse 5, the sons of uh, Chet answered Avraham, saying to him, Listen to us, my Lord, you are a prince of God in our midst. In the choice of our burial places, bury your dead. So maybe the choicest of our burial places. Each one from us, I'll smooth this out, but each one from us, his grave, he will not withhold from you from burying your dead. Okay, verse 7. Vayakom Avraham vayishtachu la'am ha'aretz livnei chet. Vayedaber itam lemor im yesh et nafshichem Lick bore et meti, melifanai, shema uni, ufig uli, the Ephron ben Sochar. 
verse 9. Vayeten li et ma'aratz ha asher lo, asher bekze tzadehu, bekesef male yitenena li, betochichem la'achuzat kaver. Okay, translating back in verse 7. And Abraham got up and he bowed to the bowed to the people of the land, to the sons of Chet. And he said, and he spoke with them saying, this is, uh, if, if there is your soul, so, or your life, and nefesh here is used uh, for intention. So if you are truly uh, willing, usually how it's uh, translated, uh, uh, to bury my dead uh, away from me, Listen to me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Sochar, that he may give to me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him, which is at the end of the edge of his field, in exchange for the full price or fullness of silver, may he give it to me in your midst as a burial a possession. Verse 10. The Ephron Yoshev betok bene chet. The Yaan Ephron hachiti et Avraham. The Ozne vene chet. Le chol ba e sha'ar iro. Le mor. Verse 11. Lo Aroni, Shema Eni, Hasade, Natati Lach, Bahama Ara Asher Bo Lacha, Natatiha, Le Ene Vene Ami, Natatiha Lach, Kavor Metecha. Verse twelve. Vayishtahu Avraham, Lithne Am Haaretz. Vayedaber el Ephron, Boozne am Haaretz, Lemor ach, or Lemor ach im at halu shema eni. Natati kesif hasade kach nimeni, the ekbara et meti shama. Okay, translating from verse 10. And now Ephron dwelled among the sons of Chet, and Ephron the Chittite answered Avraham, in the ears of the sons of Chet, for all who entered or who were entering the gate of his city, saying, verse 11, no, my Lord, listen to me. I have given uh, the field to you. And the cave which is on it or in it to you, I have given it. Uh, before the eyes of the sons of my people, I have given it to you. Bury your dead. Verse 12. And Abraham, and Abraham bowed before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron, in the ears of the people of the land, saying, Indeed, if you are willing, or if this is sort of actually ungrammatical and perhaps him like stuttering, so we could do this as uh, only if you, only that, listen to me. I have given silver, or I've given the price of the field, um, take, for, take from me so that I might bury uh, my dead there. I, I kind of want to go back and just make that smoother for you all. And it's, um, it's something like, if you are indeed willing, then listen to me. I have given the price, or I'm giving the price of the field. Take, for, take it from me so that I might bury my dead there. Okay, verse 14. Ya'an Ephron, Et Avraham le Morlo. 
Aroni Shema Eni Eretz Arba Me Meot Shekel Kesif Beni Uvenech Uvenecha Mahi Beet Metecha Kavor. Verse sixteen Vaishma Abraham El Ephron Vaishkol Abraham Le Ephron Et Hakesif A share to bear. Ozne vene hit Arba me ot shekel kesif over la socher. Okay, translating in verse 14. Now Ephron or Ephron answered Avraham, saying to him, My lord, listen to me. The land uh, is 400 shekels of several silver. What is that between me and you? Barry, you're dead. Avraham listened to Ephron, and he weighed, and Avraham weighed for Ephron the silver, which he spoke in the ears of, or about which he spoke in the ears of the sons of Chet, 400 shekels of silver. And then over the sochik is um, it's kind of idiomatic, but like the, the price of the merchants, a fair price or the going rate of the merchants. Verse 17, we'll read to the end here. The Yakom Sade Ephron Asher Ba Machpela Asher Lifne Mamre Hasade Bahama Ara. Asher bo, the whole ha eats, Asher ba sade, Asher behol, give ulo saviv, the Avraham lim cana, le a ne bene hate, the whole ba e shaar ero. Verse nineteen. The Achare hain, Kavar Avraham et Sarah ishto. El ma'arat sade hamachpela alpene mamre hi hechevron ve'eretz kanaan. And then finally, verse 20. Ve'yakom hasade v'chama ara asher bo la'avraham la'achuzat chaver me'et b'nei chet. Okay, translating verse 17. The field of Ephron, uh, it's literally it rose, but this is um, other occasionally used for like was deeded or kind of changed possessions. The field of Ephron was deeded, which was, um, which was in Machpelah, which uh, was bef beside Mamre. The field and the cave, which was in it. And all the trees which were in the field, which were in all the ter all of his his territory all around. So then was deeded to Abraham as a possession. This is verse 18, in the eyes of the sons of Chet. And in all, and before all, perhaps the who entered were entering the gate of his city. Verse 19, and after thus, or after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, um, to into the cave um, of the field of Machpelah, uh, beside Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And the field was deeded, and the, the cave which was in it to Abraham as a burial possession from the sons of Chet. The end, okay. So this is probably a chapter that um, may, I, I doubt it gets as much attention as some of the others. And, you know, there may be some good reasons for that, but uh, what questions or observations do you all have? Now this, these questions can be exegetical or, theological or grammatical, if you want to ask questions about 
Hebrew, please do so. <clears throat> so I, I was studying uh, from my grammar textbook and I was, I was looking at, I think it's called the interrogative or an in, interrogative construct or something along those lines. Basically a question mark comes up, but it's how the words are structured. And so I was looking at verse 15 and it, it was hard for me to really grasp. Um, uh, so I felt like verse 15, there's a question, you know, what's, what's this between us or whatever. And I'm like, how, yeah. how do we know where those things fit and how they function? Sure. Yeah. So good grammatical <laughs> question. So there is a, an interrogative, Hey, and that attaches to the beginning of a question. It is like a question mark, except it's a, it's attached to the beginning instead of the end. Um, and it's not officially a punctuation mark and interrogative. Hey, marks polar interrogatives or yes no questions so questions that you can answer with yes or no in this case you have the word ma right so ma he is what is that um so there's your it, it's a it's a what question instead of a yes no question but it is marked with an interrogative word there are there are questions in the bible that are not that are not marked like yes no questions that are not marked with the interrogative hey and then the only thing that we have to determine that is that it's a question or not um, is context and we, we have these kinds of questions in english too like and this is not really this isn't true for this story at all but just since you brought it up you know we can ask i can ask you a question with tone you're going to the store right asks you a question and for that matter where we put our tone marks what's being asked you're going to the store or you're going to the store are two different questions yeah, but they're both anyway we can also switch the word order are you going to the store and uh the hey interrogative is like a switch in word order uh, equivalent in english but um there are probably tone it worked the same way for them. It's just that's lost to us. I, I noticed there were a lot of, you know, imperatives in the conversation, the direct discourse. And um, I remember reading somewhere that, you know, imperatives can sometimes be translated as kind of a, a polite request. And, you know, this, this does seem, seems pretty formal you know, yeah. throughout. Um, and I, I don't know the significance of that. I guess it's just an observation, but if there is any significance, it's just something I noticed and, and, um, and just wondered if there was much to it. Yeah, well, this is a formal negotiation. I think that you're right. Uh, and it, it, not just imperatives, but sh the Shema imperative, like begins, they, it's, it does seem to be, I mean, they're being cordial right in fact they're kind of showing deference to one another at every turn whether it's avraham bowing down um not just really doesn't bow down to ephron but to the people but, but so he's showing deference and ephron seemingly showing deference by saying you know you don't have to pay for this you know i'm giving it to you but you're right the imperatives begin um li listen to me listen to me and it, it's interesting that once you get to verse 16, then you have the Vayetol, Vayishma, Avraham listened. It's sort of like it was resolved at this point. Um, it, it, if you just follow the Shema's through this, um, it's almost always imperative until you get to, to that one. But I, you're right, it's an imperative, but it's, it, it doesn't have a sense of like, you must do this. It's just, it, I imagine in, it's like two people deciding who's going to pay the bill. No, I got this. You know, like, <laughs> you're going to let me pay for this. No, you're going to let me pay for this. You know, like this kind of back and forth. <laughs> Other observations or questions? Yeah, John? Uh, it's... Uh... Striking to me that uh, Abraham approaches the Hittites almost uh, very humbly, almost hat in hand, 
uh, and asked for this burial place. And they answer him, uh, you're a mighty prince among us. Take yeah. any land you want. Uh, I, I, I haven't uh, prepared myself well enough to have the context leading up to this, but this seems striking. Right. So, yeah, let's talk about verse six. We have the imperative, Shema Enu, listen to us, Adoni. So they recognize Abraham as an Adon, a master, a Lord. And I think another word of de deference here. But then they say, Nasi Elohim Ata, which Elohim here can mean um, kind of a superlative or a, an emphatic way of saying mighty or powerful. Um, I, I translated it as a prince of God. Uh, I think they may recognize in Avraham as a man, as a man who is blessed by God. And the, this kind of goes back, this is, I think, significant even to thinking about like Genesis 12, those who bless Avraham will be blessed. And then you have like, you know, the Abimelech story or wherever, wherever Avraham goes, the blessing of God is with him. And the word blessing is not used here, but to be recognized as a prince of God, perhaps is a way of them saying, oh, we know God's with you. We're not messing. We're not messing around here. Um, so that I think I, I, although Elohim could be like a mighty prince, I, I like, I, I think there may be something to this of being a prince of God uh, of some, in some way um, in our midst. Uh, John, I don't know. I, for, I started off on my own track, but your question or observation was. I, th I thought it was. Uh, I, was there some context prior to chapter 23 that uh, gave okay. them this impression of Abraham or not? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we, the most of the stories that we have with Abraham interacting with the people of the land are, well, we've, we've seen it in Egypt and that, and we've seen it in Gerar with Abimelech, where it's like playing Sarah off to be his sister and then, you know, it's sort of like this deceive, um, yeah, just deceitful stories in some ways. Um, but then Abraham makes gets blessed because of it. Um, not a whole lot. There's some. It's usually negotiations over wells or possessions. You know, kind of. But I do think that there is a context of seeing Abraham as a a sojourner or a foreigner that. This this is one of those main stories where they're they're blessed. I mean, it's that's really what this story is about. What does it mean for Abraham to be a sojourner in the promised land? You know, the land that God has ordained for him and his family, but it's not yet given to him. So this is kind of a new element. This is really adding a lot to that story, even though we've seen it occasionally um, so far in Genesis. There's a the the in, at the very beginning of the story you do have the introduction or Avraham introduces himself um, this way. Let's see um, when he starts speaking, verse four: Ager v'toshav anochi imachem. So Ager is a foreigner or an alien, you know, um, an outsider, a non-Canaanite in this context. And a toshav, a now yashav means to dwell. So, um, but this is a regular phrase that's used for kind of a, a, actually an exile, an exilic experience. Um, I saw some, and I was reading Vesterman, and he cited 1 Peter 2.11. It's paroikais kai but which is a phrase that's, I think, um, translated uh, foreigner in exile for, for in First Peter. Um, so that actually works really well as we think about this story as kind of an exilic story. Um, what does it mean for Abraham to have no possession in the land that, where he lives his days? To be a foreigner and how that 
relates to the exilic, the exiles of a later generation, and then even in the New Testament, this kind of exilic experience. Go ahead, Dustin. I, I was interested in um, verse eight, whenever you're talking about nephish. Yeah. Um, that the use of it there, and even I was looking at, <clears throat> I have the Bible Hub app that kind of helps me sure. working my way through while I don't really know <laughs> very much vocabulary. Uh -huh. And it even translates there as your wish or what have you. Yeah. Um, and that, that was just kind of unusual to me that normally it's involving life or, or something along those lines. And that's a totally different word than I would have put there. Yeah, it's a it's an unusual phrase. It does occur in Second Kings nine fifteen. If you're anybody's interested in tracking this down, um, also in negotiation, and it's sort of like if you are willing in that context as well. Second Kings nine fifteen. Um, it's a but you're right. I mean, it's a kind of a odd phrase maybe we can get at the what the nephish is here a little bit of sort of an internal life um sort of like if you're really uh well i don't even know how to i i don't think there's a the typical slot words for translating nephish of life or even soul does you know um or nephish in its oldest meaning can mean like appetite or desire or throat even can kind of relate to the neck neck it doesn't hear but uh, perhaps it gets the kind of internality of their intention if you're this is really your intention that seems I mean, it's always hard with idioms we think about once they become idiomatic you kind of, they kind of lose touch with their original word and that's true in all languages so and we can't look at an idiom and sort of try to dig up the etymology of that to get the meaning. So clearly it means something like if you, uh, if you are willing, uh, but it's, a, it's, an odd, it's an odd phrase. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't make any sense that if there is you your life, that's what it is, y'all's life. If there is y'all's life, <laughs> um, then, you know, so if you're willing makes best sense, but it's worth paying attention to just maybe how they're understanding it. At one point, how they might have understand stood nephish as to be this kind of source of intention or willingness. I had a question about verse 15, yeah. um, where it talks about bury your dead and make the cause a, a participle. Uh, and I, I was just surprised by that because I would expect a you know a noun there, and I was just wondering um, if if Bible. I, I also looked on Bible Hub on that, and it called it participle. So um, if that's correct, you're talking about the very last word, divorce. Yes. So I would take that as an imperative. Um, it could be two things. That form could be an imperative, masculine, singular, very. It's also the form of the infinitive construct, which it does appear that way. But if you look at the end of verse six, um, you have mikvor metecha. So th there it has the min preposition in front of it. And when you have prepositions on that form, it's, it's going to be the infinitive construct. So, it, so from burying of your dead, um, whereas, in verse 16, it would be the imperative. Now, if it says participle, I think that's just an error because co the masculine singular participle would be covert. Okay, yeah, it's verse 15. Um, I'm sorry, verse verse, says, yeah, the last word in yeah, verse okay. 15. Where it says metaka, or is that how you say that? Yeah, metaka kavor. Okay, the word before the last word is the one they're calling a participle. Oh, okay. Um, that's interesting. So that's from, they're taking it from Mavit. 
or moat. Moot is the not, the verb to die. This makes some sense to me. Um, uh, so, and this is, we've seen this all the way through, even from the very beginning. If you go back to the beginning, you see the verb in verse two, vatamot, the very first word of verse two. That's just the vayiktol of this verb, moot, to die. So Sarah died. And then in verse three, Avraham got up from beside Meto, his dead. Um, so it's, it is a participle being used as basically as a noun, as a one who is dead, which is a, a common way for participles to be used. It's, I mean, it's essentially his, his dead one. Um, and so, yeah, that makes sense. That's the same thing that runs all the way through, including in the end of verse 15, Metecha. Thank you. But it's a weird form because it's that middle week form. It's, um, it has a vav in the middle, so they, they, get, they get funky um, in, in their different forms. Okay, good. Good mix of grammatical and exegetical questions here. Other observations or questions? Yeah, Noel. Um, just a, a, a cultural question. Um, is there any significance to the price, the 400 shekels? Uh, um, is that a good deal or is the, did he uh, pay full bill? Yeah, before I give what I think on that, what, what, is, what do we... I'm just curious about what way it comes off to you all in the story. Does it sound like Efron wants to give him a deal, or what do you think? And I it, think there is an answer to it. But the the thing to me, this is kind of what I was joking about when we started. And what's what's 400 shekels among friends? You know, yeah. um, I think the process is sort of. Uh, I don't know if you know who Robert Oglesby is, but he uh, he preaches where I where I work. Well, he I should say he used to. 52 years he was there. Okay. And I remember talking to him about in West Texas, where he used to be in Breckenridge, he said, if somebody, you know, you would invite somebody three times. So you want to come to lunch? No, we don't want to impose. He goes, no, we have, we have everything we need. No, I mean, that's nice of you, but he goes, no, really, we have it. And then they're, oh, okay, I'll come, kind yeah. of a thing. So it's like, you have to ask three times and then it's serious. And um, so I think this is sort of one of those kind of customs where there's there's sort of a negotiation going back and forth. He said, no, I'll give it to you. And he said, no, let me pay for it. No, really, it's fine. And no, let me pay for it. He goes, I mean, really, what's what's 400 shekels? That's no big deal. He goes, okay, I heard, here's your money. It's like, I think that's just sort of the, the cultural negotiation process of how do you name a price? And it's kind of a, um, a cultural experience, I guess, is all I would say. But that's what I, I hear it as. Right. I mean, he does say that what's 400 shekels between me and you, and you sort of like, come on, this is, it, he makes it sound like a small price. Um, the, there are a couple of clues just from the rest of the Bible. And, and in the one hand, we're talking about, you know, when we read these patriarchal narratives, they're being written, I think, from a, a period long after them. So they're sort of being recalled in some ways, the measures, um, how they would be heard later on, you know, might differentiate, but you have other land being bought. I think I wrote these down or I saw them. So like in Jeremiah 32, when Jeremiah builds a field, now this is right before exile and prices are pro perhaps down, land is cheap. He buys a, a field for 17 shekels. That'd be really cheap if, if this is a good deal. Um, where is the other one? The, I think it's, um, I'm not seeing where I wrote it down, but it was Omri, um, buys acres and acres and acres for like 6,000 shekels at some point. I'm not remembering, maybe somebody remembers where that might be. What verse is this? Oh, here it is. Yeah. 6,000 Omri pays for the whole area on which Samaria is to be built. So well, he buys basically a, 
whole plot of land for the city of Samaria for 6,000 shekels, which is a lot, but it does make it sound like this is actually a pretty big price. Um, so this is uh, Vesterman's point. One sees how high the sum of 400 shekels is when he compares it with these other two stories. So it, it makes it sound like Ephron's saying, you know, 400 shekels, what's that between us, between you and me, if, between friends or whatever, or neighbors? Um, but it is actually a, sig a significant price. And it may be sort of Ephron's way of saying, well, I mean, it's, it's not cheap, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm willing to give it to you. And Avraham is like, no, I'm, I'm paying full price. Can I ask about, he, he, they specifically mentioned the trees on the land. Like they said, yeah. the cave and the field and all the trees. Um, we, we had the opportunity to go to Grand Cayman and they were telling us in Grand Cayman, they said that the value of somebody's yard was based on how many fruit trees they had. And uh, some of them looked ugly as could be, but it was like there's a banana tree and like all these kind of citrus fruits and stuff. Um, yeah. But so, so the trees brought a substantial value. And I wonder, being over in, in that part of the world, there, there's not a lot of trees to be had. And I can't help but wonder if you've already got mature trees. And in fact, earlier we talked about um, Abraham plants a tamarisk tree. Yeah. Um, I wonder if the trees may also be associated with the value of the land because there's already full grown trees that provide shade and stuff where yeah, that may be hard to come by. I, I don't right. know. It's a guess, but uh, no, there are curiosity too. Yeah, Abraham's right. Even he sits by the oaks of Mamre, right? So like we'll, we'll, we've seen Abraham hanging out by trees and they aren't insignificant here. He, I think one, and one of the takeaways from that is that what he ends up buying is a whole lot more than just a cave. I mean, he buy, he wants to, he goes into the negotiation looking for, to own a, a burial place, to, to buy a burial place. And Ephron offers the field. And in some ways it's the Hittites who kind of offer this for him, but uh, before, you know, nobody's gonna refuse you. A burial place, but what Abraham ends up getting is much more than a burial place. I mean, it's it's described at the end as being like even the whole territory all around. Um, so he's looking for a ma'ara, a cave uh, for a cave of Machpelah, and he gets the field uh, where the cave is. So there's this Abraham comes out. Uh, kind of, it's positive for everybody in some ways. Uh, I think the Hittites, you know, they look generous or at least willing to work with him or they respect Abraham. Abraham is refusing to take it as a gift. Um, he wants to pay the fair price of it. And then they end up giving, or he ends up getting uh, a plot of land more than just uh, the cave itself. Scott? Do we know anything about time frame on this uh, with regard to the story <clears throat> with Isaac and Genesis 22, how much time has passed? Oh, that's a good question. Not really. I mean, it's just um, in verse 20 of chapter 22, you have one of those, and after these things, um, And then at the beginning of 23, it just begins really a new kind of narrative. Um, so there's not really any time marker. Well, we do have the years of Sarah's life being 127. So in chapter 22, we don't have Sarah's age, I don't think, but we do know. You can sort of put the pieces together, I suppose, of when she bears Isaac and when she dies, and I'm not doing the math in my head right now, so maybe, I mean, I think with these patriarchal stories, yeah, you can, you can kind of do that in general without, without a great deal of precision, but um, some time has passed, and, and the ne next story will be sort of turning toward the Isaac story. I, I've, I've, I think in Genesis, you, kind, you really have two major heroes 
or major story pro protagonists of the stories you have Avra, in the patriarchal narratives you have Avraham and Jacob and I, I take Isaac's stories to be essentially kind of folded into both he's a he's a rel among the patriarchs he's a relatively passive character he, he's got he's a care he's a patriarch he gets listed among them but sort of like some we're still in the Avraham stories even in chapter 24 and then Jacob's kind of becomes the main character and even Joseph's stories become really part of Jacob's stories or they're kind of as, that's not really answering your question Scott but just kind of took me to that place of the nature of uh, these stories in, in general but some time has passed There are a couple of different takes on like why this story matters so much. Um, like why take up 20 verses of our precious text telling us about a negotiation about a cave. And I think we've hit on some of the some of them. Um, some would take it simply to be sort of a an extended contractual narrative that gets folded in. Um, took a note on Gerhard von Rad, he's a relatively old older theologian at this point, um, but he, he has a kind of a theological point takeaway that the book I'm reading out of is from Klaus Vestermann's commentary. He disagrees with Von Rod, but he says, um, in death, the patriarchs were heirs no longer strangers. In other words, because, I mean, this is the cave that Sarah is going to be uh, buried in, but also Abraham and um, Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah. Rachel will not be buried here, but kind of the uh, Leah being the oldest one anyway. But this is where the patriarchs will be buried so that in death they are no longer strangers because they are in their kind of, they're kind of like they're in their homeland by being buried in, in the cave. Um, so a very small part of the promised land, the grave belonged to them Therefore, they didn't have to rest in Hittite land or Hittite earth or the grave of the Hittite. Now, he may, the commentary goes on to say, well, the text really doesn't support this theological takeaway, but I think there's something to it that this is sort of a, a predecessor, a precursor to what's, what's coming is that Abraham is a wanderer all of his life, but there's this one place. And even when Joseph dies, you know, the they bring his bones back to the cave at Machpelah. This is sort of the precursor to the conquest that will take place later in a much more violent way, not, not so peaceful as we see here. So I think there's that point. There's also, I think this really important point of exile. If, if this is being read or perhaps even copied and produced during the exilic period, uh, the people of Israel or Judah are in exile in Babylon, being buried potentially in ground that is um, not theirs, that is not the given land by the Lord. And then maybe looking to this story as um, a way of kind of promise, uh, what, what, what burial practice might look like in a time when you're away from the temple and all of these things. Um, and a lot of the stories in the patriarchs are about birth and marriage and burial. Um, that's what life kind of religious rites look like in, in the land uh, or when you're in exile away from your homeland. Or maybe that stirs something up or other questions or uh, we have a, a few more minutes. So if you wanna ask more questions, feel free. Uh, I'll go with Scott and then Dustin. I guess the reason I asked about the time frame is that <clears throat> um, this kind of sits between two significant events <clears throat> in Abraham's life, the, the giving of his son, voluntarily giving um, over to be received back, but also the next chapter is Isaac and Rebecca's marriage. And so it seems to me that this is kind of the winding down of Abraham's life that he's seeing the plane starting to land here in the transition mm -hmm. of, um, of his own state to uh, his, his children to, to basically, you know, 
for God to make good on his promise that he has to fulfill the, the promise of, of nations and, and a people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, I think a, a really important point. Uh, if you think about the story is of, of Abraham, as we've been reading him week by week, here we are coming to the end of them. And we've, you know, so much of the story was about children having a, an heir. And that's you know, coming right off of that. And then the next story will, will sort of be about that as well. But this one is, I, I feel like it's more tied to the promise of the land and the nations, um, which is running throughout these stories as well. So, I mean, it's a way to talk about Sarah's death, but it's really more about the place and her burial. Others, Dustin, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, this this um, exilic language that you're talking about, where it's it's really written, you know, from the idea of that Abraham was a foreigner. You know, I you know I can't remember where it is, but um, it's in Deuteronomy somewhere where they say a wandering Aramean was my father, and this is kind of this this idea of of associating with one of the feasts, and they talk about how there was no there was no land for them really to dwell. And um, you, you said that basically in death and whether or not it's theologically supported, you, you know, is kind of what you're talking about. But in death, they finally had a, a place that was to rest, if you will. And um, if I remember right, the Jews would, would very much say whenever somebody dies, may he rest. And then they'll go on to say whatever they're going to say. Um, I think it's interesting that that in his life he was wandering, he dwelled in tents, and he was a nomadic shepherd. And um, then in his death, he actually had a place to go that was ultimately going to be the promised land where, where yeah. his his descendants were headed to. And uh, there's there's kind of a metaphor that I was thinking about with our own selves that in in this world he never owned any land, he never really owned anything um, that he could call this is my home. Uh, he was always in in flux so to speak and then now i think where we are um as people we're in a very similar situation we're, we're sort of supposed to be strangers and aliens and sojourners in this land in which we live until we finally get laid to rest and then we'll be theoretically in the promised land i think there's there's yeah. kind of a metaphor there that i was looking at that may or may not hold water but that's what i was thinking about well, and, you know, I think that's part of what like Von Rod was trying to say is that the story is um, about the promise and sort of, uh, you know, and this runs throughout the biblical story, Old and New Testament, uh, and it's true for our own lives where we're people of the promise that we have a down payment of that promise, but we're waiting for its fullness. And that's, uh, I think that this hits home for, for that, that theory, whether we're talking about, you know, the spirit being uh, now uh, a, a down payment sort of a sort of, but there's more coming. And I think this, this coordinates well. And Abraham's story is all about the promise, promise of the land, the promise of the children, but this is sort of a, a foreshadowing of, of what's to come that Abraham otherwise will not experience. Uh, Dan. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, okay. In verse six, the the wording uh, looks like uh, the, uh, the the child of Heth <laughs> Hittite uh, is is saying, uh, "You're you're a great one among us. Uh, bury your dead in the choicest of our graves." Mm -hmm. It's like he's saying, become a Hittite. Ah. Give up your independent ethnicity and become one of us. And Great. Abraham, by insisting on a price, is saying, I'm staying who I am. Is that a message you're getting out of this? I thought about that makes a lot of sense of what's to come. Um, that that why Abraham would refuse the gift um, and pay for it. I, that, I, there is some, 
I mean, Abraham makes it really clear in verse four what he is, right? A ger and a toshav with you. Um, and that's why he, he has to request to give the burial place. And then the people say, you're right, uh, among us. Um, and that phrase actually, betochenu, right? Um, among us will come up when, with Ephron. Um, Ephron was among, this verse nine, Ephron was dwelling among the sons of Chet. And then we heard out that he is, he is one of them, a Chittite. Um, so I, I'm thinking about what you're saying here, whether they're, whether they're entreating him to just join, join their people. Uh, they're acknowledging either way that he has been, they've been neighbors. They've been, he's, he's living among them um, as a Nasi Elohim. I think, you know, perhaps so, Dan. I, I think, and I, I do think that Avraham, I like this, this, especially the second point that he, he wants, he's not going to take a gift because he's not, he's not into syncretism type of stuff, you know, or he's not going to become one of them. He's like, no, I'm different. I have to buy this, you know, uh, there's this kind of land ownership issue that, yeah, probably does relate to distinction and ethnicity and so on. Um, even if, even if uh, in verse six, they aren't necessarily straightforwardly saying, hey, just become one of us. Um, Abraham perhaps senses that and pushes back against it. That's, that's an interesting Thanks. thought. Yeah. Scott? It's funny, Dan just mentioned that because I was tracking along a similar line, not necessarily from the language of uh, the request from the Hittites, but more from the insistence of Abraham uh, on paying uh, the full price. Verse nine is what he, we insist on paying the full price. Yeah. And then thinking, tying in <clears throat> what's to come later with, um, with, uh, with Esau and Esau marries two Hittite women and, and in chapter 26, it says that they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca. And then, you know, they insist that Jacob goes away to marry uh, basically from the family. So there's this sense that, you know, we are, we are independent. We don't want to be involved with you in any way. We want to pay for our land. We want to be our own people. We don't want to involve ourselves with you. So seems like there's already the beginnings of this distinction that later becomes a, a core tenant of the of the Israelite people, the Hebrew people of independence and self-sufficiency. Right. Yeah, it's good. I mean, Abraham's called to be a foreigner. He hasn't called to just leave his homeland and go join another, the Canaanites. And there's this just the real clear distinction. And the Hittites are not portrayed negatively at all here um like so many of the stories that will come in israel's history i mean they seem generous and uh, willing and you know they recognize abraham's authority as a nasi elohim and so on but that doesn't mean that kind of openness perhaps to that the hittites give doesn't mean that abraham shouldn't uh, remain distinct. And I, I like the ties you're making, Scott, with like what's to come with Esau's uh, intermarriage and, and so on. Yeah. Well, good. This is, I mean, what I love, I love about the Bible. I love our group because I've, I'm, I'm, the, some of these ties you all are making, I hadn't thought about. So I always learn, learn something and the Bible never ceases to um, be rich, uh, a rich field for new insights and uh, thankful for how God speaks through the, the text and, and our community here. All right. Well, um, we will resume if you're not if you're on Facebook and I'm really not doing this because I want everybody to join Facebook. But if you, so if you're not on Facebook, you can ignore this. But if you're on Facebook, join the Hebrew Story Hour page for updates. 
it's pretty much all I will be on there. And also these, these videos appear there. If you wanna share with others or invite others into our group, it is certain, all are, all are welcome. So we'll meet again uh, the first Wednesday of, of January. Uh, we'll be off for two weeks and then be back. So thank you all for your participation. Adonai imachem. Thank you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So will that be January 5th? That sounds right.